A few thousand years ago, Moses went up to the top of Mount Sinai and came back with God's Ten Commandments that were inscribed in a stone tablet. So that's the story I know, that's probably the story you know, but according to Monish Pabrai, when Moses was coming down the hill, he dropped the tablet which shattered it and the real commandments were lost forever. But then a miracle happened, a modern day miracle happened and God chose Mr. Pabrai to reveal those commandments to the world which Monish religiously did in 2018 in this talk with the students of Carroll School of Management. This talk was pretty long, almost two and a half hours, and what I've tried to do here is to crunch Prophet Pabrai's commandments into 10 focus snippets that we can carry with us at all times. These commandments are centered more around running an investment management business, but as I watch this video and the more I thought of it, I think much of it can be connected with our own beliefs, behaviors, and investment decisions. With that being said, let's start with Pabrai's commandment number one. Thou shall not skim of the top. So what the Lord is telling investment managers, fund managers, is to never exploit a situation. Contextually, Mr. Pabrai makes a case against hedge funds and PMS companies that usually take 1 or 2% as fixed fee and also add a performance layer on top of it. A large part of this thinking comes from what Buffett did when he had his original partnership in the 1960s, which followed a 0625 structure. That is, Buffett did not charge his clients anything if the fund's performance was less than 6% and anything over 6% was split 75-25 with only 25% of the excess profit profit going to him. Now specific to India and mutual funds, we presently operate on a total expense ratio basis which can go as high as 2.25% of the investment amount. But in April of last year, this news came in about a proposal of introducing performance link charges on select mutual funds wherein the base fees, the fixed percentage could be reduced and additional charges would be levied on the basis of the fund's performance, which is definitely a welcome move. So especially for us investors, I think this commandment is there to help us build awareness of how the fees are structured for basic investment products like mutual funds, insurance policies, annuities, and definitely for complex products like PMS, small case, structures, hedge funds, and private equity funds. When Mr. Pabrai says, thou shall not have an investment team, what he's emphasizing on is that investment management as a profession is not a team sport and is in fact designed more to be an individual pursuit. At least that's what I really like about investing, that is for two individuals to trade, there has to be a difference of opinion wherein one person thinks the share price is likely to go up while the other is convinced that the price is probably going down. In fact, I always say this to people I know and especially for ones on Twitter or even YouTube comments that there is absolutely no reason to get aggressive or critical or to engage in a fight with someone who doesn't agree with your investment thesis. On the contrary, you should feel happy that the other person is not agreeing with you because then it gives you an opportunity to buy the stock cheaper or to sell it to that person at a higher price which should be your primary goal rather than you massaging your ego. So this is definitely some food for thought and even in his talk, Mr. Pabrai spoke of the fact that firstly, no two human beings are going to have the same circle of competence, which means even if you consult someone for advice, it's always better to build your own thesis. And secondly, because investment analysis is where all the fun is, you really don't want to be delegating this part of the task. I think both these points are absolutely in line with what I want my newsletter to be. That is, I can help investors out with five to seven investing ideas a month, and then you, the reader, can do a couple of hours of research on top of it and bring that list down to two or three promising investments in line with your philosophy and circle of competence. We'll have many more discussions around the newsletter as I wanted to make it one of my primary offerings. But for now, please consider subscribing to it at shankarnath.com. Okay, this third commandment according to Pabrai is not from God, the supreme being, but this one comes from one of the gods of investing, Sir John Templeton, who said it time and again that the investment process is an inexact science involving a multitude of factors working in different directions. So understandably, this exercise has a high error rate. And as for Mr. Pabrai, it should come as no surprise that if you or I or anyone were to pick a grouping of 10 stocks, then at least four of them will not behave in the way you expected them to perform. In fact, when I'm researching for stocks now, I'm always trying to answer this one question for myself, that is, will this stock become a 10-bagger 10 years from now? 
It's a very interesting question to ask yourself every time you invest in a stock for the long term. And when I simulate it in line with what Mr. Pabra is saying, even if my stock picking success is 30%, which means 3 out of 10 stocks become at least 10 baggers, while the rest 70% turn to zero, even then I can come out with a 20% CAGR. So recognize this fact, or rather be humble to accept the fact that no one, including you and me, exactly knows how our highest conviction ideas will actually shape up. Thou shall look for the hidden P of 1. It's a very interesting commandment because while all of us understand a P ratio of 1, it's a hidden P of 1 that Mr. Pabrai seems to be more interested in. But let's take it from the top. So a price earning multiple of 1 means a company's market capitalization is equal to the net profits of that company. So when I set it up on a standard screener, I see there are 19 stocks whose current market cap is less than the company's net profits for the last four quarters. Of course, this number is not hidden, it's very much visible, but unfortunately, most of these companies are useless, at least from our point of view. For instance, GFL Limited had a net profit of 2,200 crores entirely on account of an exceptional and one-time income that the company received from its demerger. Similarly, Reliance Home Finance faces liquidation. SKI Infrastructure Limited manage 1,100 crores of net profits on sales of zero and so on. So this is not our subset and as per Mr. Pabrai, what we want are companies that might currently be at a PE of 10, 15, even 30, but can quickly go down to a PE of 1. Now, I won't get into specifics of this as I've already covered it in a previous video, but as an illustration, let's look at Petronet LNG Limited. Okay, so for much of the last three years, Petronet had a market cap of 30,000 crores. With a net profit of around 4,500 crores, this gives us an average P ratio of 6.6. .6. Now, there was a recent news item that Petronet is increasing capacity and is therefore targeting a 200% increase in profit. So what was 4,500 crores now, the management wants to take it up to 13,500 crores by 2028 which means Petronet's P ratio of 6.6 .6 is effectively a 2.2 as of FY28 estimates, which brings it a lot closer to Pabrai's 1P target. So this is what the hidden P of 1 is. And in my video, I've taken the example of Alibaba and built a case on why this massive tech company is effectively at a P ratio of just 3.8 as per its FY28 numbers. Mr. Pabrai's point is simple. If you can create a portfolio of these hidden P of 1 companies, then generally good things will happen to you. Thou shall never use Excel. This seems impossible in today's day and age, but I kind of agree with Mr. Pabrai here. You see, while I present a lot of data in my videos, my actual investing is a lot broader and many of my decisions are based on trends and probabilities rather than the use of precise statistics. Mr. Paprai points to something similar in his talk when he says a good, simple and effective investment process is one that you can easily figure out in your head. For example, if a company's profits or free cash flows are growing consistently at let's say 10% and if your own long-term price expectation is 20%, then you don't even have to run a discounted cash flow analysis on Excel because in all probability, this investment will not be a viable one. In fact, Pabrai goes on to say that if the evaluation of an investment requires the use of complex financial models or tools like Excel, then it's a sign that the investment is too convoluted or risky. Instead, the focus here should be on making quick and straightforward assessments based on fundamental principles. And here are some stories in my newsletter where you'll find that simple yet effective assessment at play. Thou shalt always have a rope to climb out of the deepest well. That's quite a long commandment, isn't it? A little cryptic also, so let's break it down. Okay, firstly, the phrase deepest well symbolizes a challenging or difficult situation that any of us individuals might encounter in our lives or during our investment journey. In that context, Mr. Pabrai gives the example of his father who had many setbacks and also his own experience when Pabrai funds lost 65-70% in value during the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. That the word rope, again metaphorically speaking, signifies a lifeline or a means of escaping adversity. It's a symbol of hope, it represents resilience, resourcefulness and the ability to find solutions to overcome challenges. So in his father's case, Pabrai takes the example of a Hindu astrologer who would come to the house every week to give the family some hope, a reassurance of sort that everything will be fine again. 
Mr. Pabrai's point is that there are many occasions like a market downturn or a period of poor performance when an investor's resolve will be tested. But by focusing on the positive outcomes, the future potential, and by finding creative solutions, one can not only persist through these challenges, but can also come out a lot stronger on the other side. The story of Arjuna hitting the fish's eye is a well-known episode from the Mahabharata. So as the legend goes, an archery competition was organized amongst the young Pandavas and Kauravas wherein the challenge was to shoot the eye of a fish that was attached to a pole on a rotating wheel while the aim had to be taken from the fish's reflection in the water. So this was quite a challenge and when the Guru Dronacharya would ask many of the princes on what they were aiming at, most of them would say things like, I can see the ceiling, the wheel or the pole or something else. And it was only Arjun who said, all I can see is the center of the fish's eye. And as we all know, he was the only one who could successfully complete that challenge. Essentially, the story highlights the importance of focus, determination and skill in achieving success. And to draw a parallel with investing, Mr. Pabrai says one needs to be very clear on what they are looking for in a business, especially with many macro clouds hanging around that are basically designed to distract the investor. So just like what happened with the other princes, in our case, there are things like interest rates, some comment by some popular investor, news channels, some report on India's GDP, oil prices, monsoons, the price of gold, some war in some part of the world, exports, property prices, fiscal deficit, and a lot more. The point is we investors need to simplify to be successful. And just like Arjuna, one should train oneself to focus on the business and not the noise around it. Pabrai's eighth commandment is to never short a stock. So very quickly, short selling as a process involves predicting the decline in the price of a stock and profiting from it, which means it's complex, it's uncertain. And because there's an element of timing here as an activity, short selling is extremely challenging and speculative. But what I think is the worst part of this endeavor is that if you buy a bad stock for investment, then the worst thing that can happen is that it can go down to zero. But in the case of short selling, a bad bet can potentially lead to unlimited losses. And many investors have gone bankrupt in the past because of it. So essentially, Pabrai wants to drive home the point that rather than speculating on short-term price movement with limited upside, investors should instead be identifying robust companies with promising long-term growth prospects. Okay, so commandment number nine is inspired by Polonius, a character in Shakespeare's Hamlet, who advises his son to neither be a lender nor be a borrower, which is Shakespeare's way of emphasizing the importance of financial independence and avoiding debt of any kind. If you recall the story about Mr. Pabrai's father, there were many times in the Pabrai household when financial sustainability was a bit dodgy, which is why through this commandment, Monish advocates financial prudence and advises people in general to spend less than what they earn. In this context, and in spite of having a net worth running into millions of dollars, Pabrai in his talk makes a reference to Mr. Money Mustache, a software engineer named Peter Adney who used a combination of high savings, low spending and smart investing to retire in his early 30s. In fact, many of you might have heard of it as the FIRE movement, F-I-R-E, Financial Independence Retire Early. And I have a video on my channel explaining this in greater details, along with a calculator that can help you predict when and what you should be doing to retire early. To sum this up, Mr. Pabrai's advice is simple. Adopt sound financial practices, live within one's means, avoid debt, prioritize savings, and invest smartly. And finally, there's the 10th commandment, which says, Thou shalt be a shameless cloner. So Mr. Pabrai has said it in many forums that cloning and copying other people's best ideas is the pathway to fast wealth and good health. For instance, the Pabrai funds, which I think is now over $600 million, was a copycat version of how Buffett had structured his partnership in the 1960s. In fact, Pabrai releases something called the free lunch portfolio every year. And one of the three sides of that portfolio is to invest in what other great investors are betting on. The same can be replicated in an Indian context and websites like Money Control and Trendline offer a list of companies where some of India's top investors have a percent or more in shareholding. So take advantage of this is what Mr. Pabrai advises in addition to the other commandments that I've already summarized in this video. 
I sincerely hope you found some of this information helpful and that you'll be using it in your own investing going forward. I'll also encourage you to watch the entire talk and if you'd like me to summarize other such talks into smaller 15-16 minute videos, then please send me your video suggestions with the link in the comments box below. Once again, thank you for your time. Do subscribe to my channel. Do like this video, subscribe to the newsletter and I'll see you very soon. Until then.